Today, I had the pleasure of having dynamic artist duo Lobit on the podcast. Lobit is made up of uh, Kyle and Tali. Uh, they're based in New York. They have over two decades of artistic uh, practice experience. Uh, they've been featured by some of the top uh, art institutions in the world, um, always kind of pushing the limits um, and looking and doing things that just like no one's done before and are just super creative and a lot of different mediums um, over a long period of time. So I know they're a big inspiration for a ton of artists that I know and um, just people in Web3 and crypto art and also, you know, just traditional art as well. So it was a fantastic to to chat with them and to get their thoughts on a lot of these things that we talked about. And I hope that you you enjoy it. I just wanted to start out with maybe you um, explaining the background a little bit. Um, what's where did it start? What's the origin origin story of Lovid? Um, the origin story of Lovid. Well, I guess we can. Uh, I'll start by saying that Kyle and I met. Um, uh, let's say April. 2000 and uh there's you know we've talked about this before there's some videos of how we met because it was caught on camera our the first time we uh looked at each other and i introduced myself to him and i was working on uh making video for um a musical performance for a singer named victoria hana and i actually asked him the first time we met if he would be in my video and I wanted him to throw things in the air and sometimes catch them. I think that was my phrase. And uh, at the time, I started being interested in coming from the fine art background and painting and single channel video work. I became interested in the late 90s in noise and experimental music. And I wanted to, um, even before I really knew about um experimental cinema, I would say I started thinking about what would it be like to have visual work that is experienced in a similar way that sound is. And that was kind of my literal <laughs> kind of ask. But I think what I was um, interested in is inherently abstraction, really, and not just abstraction formally, but um, abstraction in uh, kind of thinking abstractly about the work. Uh, and I did feel that um, visual art and single channel video that is time-based is often defined in narrative linear ways. And so I think kind of as a young artist, I started experimenting with loops and really thinking of what this like non-narrative structures can look like and non-linear structures. So that's kind of, I guess, when I met Kyle, what was on my mind and like within a week we started working together uh, and maybe you can say where you were at at the time. Yeah. So I was, <clears throat> I was coming from a music background and um, <clears throat> doing a lot of performances. Uh, but I was really interested in expanding music. So already going from, you know, starting with classical training as a kid and then moving into sort of, jazz and more contemporary music into noise, experimental, electronic music. Um, I was already kind of obviously interested in pushing the boundaries of what is, quote, music in that sense. But I started to feel that even sound in general was potentially limited in some sense in, in a live performance setting, that there's much more that we could offer for people. And so I was trying to expand it and often had a significant performance element in the music in the concerts that I was playing. Um, and so it was very exciting when I met Tali and she was doing video and wanted to kind of do that with music. It kind of was a perfect uh, fit for where I was going. Yeah. It's so amazing that when you say that, that, you know, a lot of your work, it, it, it just, it, it's just so natural to this video and this, this visual and 
audio uh, coming together, you know, and it's just interesting that you both had uh, those from the get go, right? Those separate kind of thought process of approaching it. But then, you know, it, it, it's just amazing that you just come together and, and those two form into this duo, which you can totally see the synergy there. And um it's amazing. You know, I, I really think, you know, I, I definitely have, have, I first heard of you kind of on your art blocks release and when you came into the kind of the crypto sphere, but since then, you know, diving into your back catalog, I've just been more and more impressed to be honest. Um, and it, it, kind of one of the things was that I definitely wanted to ask you is just, um, I think, I almost think that now in the crypto art space, I think artists that are primarily have come from maybe the crypto art space of where they got their start, they're really trying to think of, um, okay, how do we display our art in a more physical sense, right? And I think that you both have like such a expertise, but also just a history of doing that, right? Um, and I just wonder your thoughts on that. Of, of I think we started out, you know, um, in this space in, in crypto, uh, just, you know, it's been just put a screen on the wall. Right. And we're just gonna, you know, do a six, 16 by nine, you know, and a TV screen and we're going to put artwork on there. And I think people are starting to get the itch that wait, that maybe that's not enough, you know, maybe that's not completely embracing the medium in a way. I'd be curious your thoughts on that. I think, you know, depends on the project obviously i think for some things a 60 by 9 screen can be can be great for it you know i think for us we've always been interested and in sort of the way that we came together kind of bridging and translating between two different media forms right between sound and video in the beginning um we've always been interested in translation and in kind of taking a signal in initially we were working with analog equipment uh starting first with things we would get sort of commercially or on eBay or whatever, uh, or at thrift stores, um, <clears throat> and kind of modifying those, hacking those physical devices, um, and then moving from there into building our own equipment. Um, but in any case, kind of starting with electrical signal and not usually using a camera or a microphone or anything like that, but using circuitry um, to generate the work and then translating this electronic signal, this electrical signal that we would generate into, you know, it's pretty easy if you play an electrical waveform through a speaker, you're going to probably get sound provided that the frequencies are in, you know, range that you can hear. Um, video is a little bit more complicated. So we, that was where we were kind of working in, in terms of analog video. Um, we were really working with that, like what defines video, what's necessary for it. And how can we either break the standard of video to make something interesting or build up the video standard ourselves so that we could kind of put our own signals into it? Um, because we were working with translation already, it was a natural fit. And especially because of the way we started where we were sort of breaking the signal. So a lot of times our favorite parts of the video would be right before the sync would just totally break down and the sync being necessary to make a recognizable picture. And at the time, we had screens, you know, cathode ray tube screens or whatever that would just go to blue, um, and that would be like it's broken. You know, you're not you're not getting any more out of that. But we loved that moment as it was breaking down. Some of our favorite parts of it, the most interesting parts, were at that moment of breakdown. So we immediately wanted to capture those moments and started to output them as prints, you know, photographic prints, and then soon into fabric. And we've done a, a lot of work uh, with fabric uh, since then, translating into that. So. You know, and then we translate into other materials uh, as well. And once you're kind of going on that translation route, you can immediately go into a lot of different types of physical representations of the work. Yeah, one of the things I I, I saw, you know, one of your exhibitions was this quilt, and and um, that was one that really struck me as wow, this is talking about the fabric aspect of it, but also that you had these digital screens or. You know, you had these 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 screens in there, and then you had stills from, you know, the outputs, um, kind of around them, and it just was striking. And maybe you could tell me a little bit about that project and just the thought behind that. Yeah, I, actually, I, um, this is a really good example. But uh, you know, the interesting things about so I'm going to talk a little bit about this relationship between we like to talk about the the 
the sort of binary of digital physical as if those are kind of opposite, but actually, um, with the exception of being online and see and just kind of this portal, uh, there's always physical displays to digital digital work. Everything exists in the physical space unless you're really in a Vision Pro or some metaverse. And so um, some of the issues that working with tangible art or work that is in print material based is that um, there's such a long history to art as the objects of art and how they are displayed and where they are displayed and what materials are used. So um, the way a work is presented uh, immediately places it in relationship with a one genre. If you're taking a digital piece and printing it as a photograph, you're in conversation with photography. If you're taking a digital piece and printing it on textile, you're in conversation with the tapestry and the complicated history of of woven material works. So we've always been very intentional about what method we're using. And Carl was using giving some examples. We've also done various works that are like these adhesive murals, basically, and sort of like have that conversation of like what it means to be on a wall or, you know, like public art. So the, and and this is something that people, you know, painters and anyone who is sculptors, people in traditional art forms deal with all the time. The way you exhibit a piece to display it in a gallery or at a home has meaning and content. And I think that uh, both because uh, crypto art, digital native art exists in this digital space, we don't have enough equipment, expertise, materials to really make something new. And so when you display a digital piece on a TV, you're in a conversation about television and about cinema and various things like that. We don't yet have, I mean, we have obviously these like innovative companies that produces screens that are for NFTs, but it's still not a statement on its own. So what we've done over the years in various ways and that piece quilt is probably one of our earliest ones is trying to be innovative or do our best to be innovative in integrating um the the media based the digital let's call it digital art within a uh, physical material so often that would mean you know making installations or sometimes actually objects that are a hybrid of screen and um textile or sculptural components so they really kind of are innovative um, physical objects as well as the work itself. They're not separated then um, from from the 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 digital content. If that makes sense. So for quilt, yeah, do you want to talk about quilt costs? Yeah. Bit? Well, I was just going to say one other point that even a purely digital work still has a physical component right. somewhere, yeah. whether it's like you know <laughs> the hardware, some Charlie somewhere yeah. on a chip or on a node somewhere yeah. or whatever. You've got keyboards, or on a bunch of nodes. Like, yes, you have yeah. you have physical components even of, of totally. that. Yeah. Um, so quilt, uh, we made it at a residency that we did at experimental TV center. I think the uh, picture of the installation that you saw was probably from Living in Arts Tulsa. in Tulsa, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We did a residency there and had an exhibition that we prepared the exhibition. Um, and that was sort of one of the larger works in that show. Um, it was basically a wall, um, with a space in between to fit the CRT screen. So those have a depth to them. That's more than a, you know, a flat screen that would be more common today. Um, and again, this idea of translating the video content in this case, the, from the electrical signal. Um, into a physical form and, and printing it, as Tali mentioned. I think the other part of that that we were really excited about was the idea of weaving, right? And <clears throat> that's why we called it quilt. Um, really thinking about not only are we translating these things, but we're connecting together these different media forms. Yeah, that's great. And I think I think that's just so cool is that... Um, yeah, like that's something even in my as an artist, like I'm just really interested in and, and continue is like, how can we do, you know, um, 
you take one medium and then it's like, you know, stretching it into another medium. And it's just really interesting to do that because it creates a, like a whole new medium by doing that. Right. And, and it's, and you feel like you're exploring something that hasn't really been done before because it's your, and maybe you're not even doing something that, that grand or that crazy, but just meshing mediums together can be really interesting, you know, and, and produce things that feel really complex or novel, but you know, they're, they're, they could be really simple, but it just feels that way because you're now pushing mediums together, which is really cool. Like, and, you know, looking at your work in, in, like you said, the quilts and, and just the whole back catalog, it's really great. It's, it's really awesome to see your installation work of, you know, like your ability to, blend the mediums, but also do it in a, phys in a physical space, right? And, and how do you experience it as someone that's actually walking into one of your installations? And, and um, it's not, it's a sum of the parts, right? That's the thing. It's, it's not just, you know, the generative art component or the, you know, uh, digital component or the analog. It's, it's, you're putting all these different kind of things together into an experience that, is really cool, you know, and I think that that's something that's really, I don't think the, the, that's been complete, at least in the crypto art space has been realized yet. And I think um, it's something I, I feel like artists will start going towards, but I think like, you know, I just don't think that it, it's, it's evolved to that level yet. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting because uh, moving image um, we is such a seductive uh, material, you know, like in any size, you're just drawn into it. Um, and so and it, it's in some sense, it's very easy to make a seductive video installation, you know, you just like, put a big projector, um, and let people enjoy it. Uh, in our work, the, but the, the challenges often of, let's call it digital art or media based art, is that the craft of creating the work is so removed from the audience, which is di very different than a painting or sewing where anyone can come and gotta get a sense. They might not know how the artist did it exactly, but there's a sense that there's a physical process to it. And over the many years, people always ask us, you know, how did you do it? Like, how did you make it? How did you do People always wanna know where the artist's intention is. And I know this is something that, um, from our perspective, like the community of generative art, code-based art, um, there's always this like um, the excitement of what the code does. Mm -hmm. But in the fine art world, the audience are just very used to seeing the artist's intentionality. Uh, and so in our work, when we're presenting um, just kind of through experimentation, really, that Kyle was talking about, like, if the, if the piece is broken, is it working? Is it kind of playing with people's expectation of what a video should look like? But there's no, not that people need, like, literal explanation of what it is, but they do need, I think, kind of, a, or at least what we want. It's not that they need it. The piece can work on its own. But our goal is always to bring people one step closer also to the making of the work because we're very process-oriented. And so even though the piece at, at, at the end can just be enjoyable we always like our goal is to bring people into the creative process in many ways and so i think because of that we've always thrived to add extra elements whether it's cables or or, or other like physical components or interactivity in some way uh but that's just very unique to this like uh you know that's like uh softness hardness maybe like the, the the pleasure of moving image and the complications of like wanting it to do more from our end yeah we we always have tried to sort of create immersive experiences with our installations and <clears throat> really bring the audience in not just into the work which you know quilt does by its scale and everything and having the physical component as well um but also into, as Tali mentioned, our process. So revealing, showing our wires or having our audience members hold wires or touch the wires in various ways mm -hmm. or plug themselves in. Um, that's always been, you know, something that we've been really excited about, about sharing that. One of the really nice things about Web3 is that most people who are involved have some level of technical knowledge and probably a lot of people with much more technical knowledge than we have in certain areas too. Um, 
And it's just really amazing to be able to bring people in. And, you know, I guess in terms of generative art, especially when people are minting it, for example, there's really this interaction that the collector has when they're minting it that really brings them into the work in a, in a, in a different way than if you go and walk into a gallery in physical space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and you talk in, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you're kind of in the small group of what I think a small group of artists that have, you know, been successful in, in crypto art, but also have been successful before that for a long time in traditional art, fine art, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I wanted to just talk about, you know, what, what are the differences you see in those spaces? Is there, is there a dichotomy there? Is it a false dichotomy? Um, I'd be curious to, to hear your take on that. Um, I guess before, <laughs> before we have, we have so many takes, um, I do want to like kind of break down this idea of, uh, traditional art or whatever other words you were using. <laughs> yeah. What do you call it? I mean, I don't, I, that's, what well, I'm, that's what I'm getting to kind of is, 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 is it an economy? It seems well, like it, there's a cultural dichotomy between right. it, but, or is it just art, you know, like right. it could just well, be that as well. But. <laughs> specifically for us, our background is really in what can be defined as experimental media. Uh, and so that's like, actually really important for us to draw that disti distinction because not distinction or just expansion because in this like crypto art world everything that's not crypto is called tr tr trad art <laughs> and actually those are like there's just like so many different things that are part of the art world and so yes. even though we have worked with many galleries and have sold some art through them most of our career has been in this experimental media and video work world and our work has been for like a for a long time was primarily supported through not-for-profit organizations with grants and commissions and fellowships and through uh educational institutions and so like actually for like you know, for 20 something, 30, 40 years, most of most artists who have worked with who work within digital media, etc, have been supported by these organizations. And so like, one of the reasons why we do feel like it's really important to talk about because there, that's actually a whole ecosystem. This that is not uh collectors based, it is not uh market driven, it's driven by uh you know, cultural institutions, um, and often public and private funding. And so it's actually kind of something that we, um, like to highlight, even though we have also done kind of work within more within like the, the art market. Um, do you want to jump in in something before I continue? Does continue. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it actually, what's really interesting for, our experience really we like to talk about like spans from uh doing a lot of performances in all sorts of weird spaces including many people's homes ar around the US and Europe performing in squats and in the biggest museums and so i think that that narrative really really gets lost of how diverse the art world really is and because people don't know of and even in galleries in New York alone, there you know there are so many, so many different kind of galleries. You have artist-run spaces and younger galleries with emerging, showing emerging artists and collectives, and then mid-career art galleries who are more who show more experimental, more you know, you know less polished work and then you have the blue chips and so i do kind of like feel like all of that gets really lumped into one thing and it's it's sort of doing disservice to honestly the crypto community and and artists to not see those there's so much to learn about how what it actually means to be an artist and what it actually means to run a gallery and what the work is how do you how do you think that you know collectors and artists that are in maybe started in the crypto art space you know how can they learn about the broader art world and what what should they be looking towards you know to to learn that i think i think with anything you have to follow what 
really gets you going, right? The things that excite you. I mean, I think as an artist, that's important. As a collector, it's equally important. You find things that you like, um, dig deep, go down the rabbit hole with it and like follow it out and figure out where, you know, if you find an artist that you like, for example, and you want to kind of see, okay, well, what else, what are they doing? You know, kind of you look through whatever they're doing, obviously in the crypto space. And then you say, okay, well, are, are they doing anything outside of there? Then if you find a gallery that's showing, you know, an artist or a couple of artists that you're interested in, which is, which is happening more and more, I think, um, from, you know, d- web three native artists, um, then you say, okay, well, maybe I'm going to check out some of the other artists there. That's like, that's one way you could start. Yeah. I mean, it, th- this is so, of course, one of the great, in my, my, pers- my opinion is one of the best things about the crypto art is that it's so international and it probably has served best to artists who live in and collectors who live in remote areas where there's not a thriving art community like like New York. So, you know, we already recognize that that's an advantage. If you come to New York, there's no shortage of places to see. But if you come to New York and you're not, I've heard interviews with, with crypto collectors who have been very put off by walking into a blue chip gallery and kind of not feeling welcomed. Well, there are dozens and dozens of galleries in lower Manhattan, in Brooklyn, and in other areas in, you know, people's homes and in small galleries that show really fresh, really exciting, really, really cool and more affordable work. So um, if you end up in uh, heading into uh, a city or a, a small town, if you're in a small town where there's a college, go to see what if they have an art department and if they have an art department they will have something that will be fun to check out if you go to a bigger city like london or new york or you know boston whatever um you can look up uh where what gallery what galleries are around you can look up art publications many of them are online um and kind of try to figure out where the art is happening I mean, I know we live all live in Twitter world or whatever the current uh, social media X, X sorry X <laughs> probably change next week. So you know, tester, probably have to edit this video because yeah. it'll whatever. probably be something else. Or whatever the current like crypto favorable uh, favorite uh, social media is, but I'm sorry to say that art happens on Instagram. And so, yeah. <laughs> if you're going somewhere and you can always just like look up one artist look up a venue and it's just kind of like 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 i guarantee any art that a collector in crypto space is interested in there will be a space that's like fun and weird and cool things happening um that they can experience in in a city near you i think one of one of the coolest things about web3 as i mentioned is sort of the the distributed nature of the community right and that's really amazing and then obviously just coming back from paris it's like just amazing to see all these people IRL that we've, you know, known and, and not necessarily always met in person. Um, and then, so that's really incredible to have that distributed community. Um, and I think that, you know, when you go to a big city, obviously there are, there are major museums there. There's, you know, probably a bunch of very well-known galleries there and then many, many lesser known galleries. Um, but the interesting thing is Tali was saying is that even small towns, have can have a really great scene and that's been one of our that was one of my favorite things when we were touring was just going to some small town you know in east end of holland you know and there's some squat there and we're playing the squad and it's just this incredible scene and people are really excited um or you go to a small town in in america and there's like a university there and maybe maybe give a lecture or something and then they have a gallery and some of those put on incredible exhibitions and it's you know it's on you know the Delmarva Peninsula or somewhere in the middle of like, you would think kind of nowhere, but there's actually really, really interesting culture there. Yeah. And we love that stuff. And and honestly, I do feel like those years and that experience really helped us in the crypto space because it's actually, it's not that different. It's a lot of people who are enthusiastic about something. They come maybe from lots of different backgrounds, but um, yeah, it's like passion and coming together is, um, you know, is, is more, more similar than, than you might think. 
So I don't know if that answered your first your question about the differences, but that's no, it does. I, I think I think also like, do you think that uh, crypto native artists should be going on Instagram and kind of uh, trying to engage kind of these other communities out there? That you know, I, I, I don't know. My, in my opinion, you know, it seems like sometimes the Web three, um, you know, sphere is 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 insular in a lot of ways, and and I think it, that can be a positive, you know, because I think it has a really strong sense of community. But I also think it's it's um, it, it doesn't we don't reach out as much. I think to to kind of the broader maybe culture or art world or, or i think people are starting to but um i think that maybe maybe there's more to be done there i don't know if you agree with that but um yeah i i definitely wouldn't i mean i feel like crypto artists are really smart and wise and they know uh their audience they understand the market um so i would not you know, I would, yeah. I don't know. If I don't. I don't. Advice. I don't think people yeah, have no. to do anything. No. It's not that people should do this, but I think if people are interested, for example, in having more physical exhibitions, because a lot of times in, yeah. in this space there are a lot of you know virtual exhibitions that happen, which are really incredible. Um, but if people want to have more access to showing their work in physical form, that might be a nice way to sort of expand into that into that field. Yeah, and I don't know if I would necessarily tell someone they have to post more. Like, it's like, like don't I would never I tell someone post more, but uh, as a research tool, it is useful. So you know, if you are looking to learn more about what galleries out there that maybe are exhibiting or what other artists, just kind of use it as a research tool. If you're going on a trip, if you're planning to visit somewhere, um, do it. Uh, yeah, like yeah, definitely don't like. I think we're just so. It's like, yeah, the whole idea of like post more, like, like it's just such a, such a slippery slope. Like we can't measure our, uh, our well being by like likes and, uh, and followers. Yeah. So, yeah. For sure. Definitely. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to ask next, um, you obviously have had, you know, an art career that has now spread across decades. Um, and I wanted to see like, you know, what keeps you going? What do you, do, what advice do you have for, um, artists that are just getting started or, you know, are a couple years in and, um, how do you keep going and not have a, you know, it, it, maybe you have fallen into kind of, um, creative blocks or where you, where you have, you struggle to create work or, or work that excites you. But um, how do you maintain an art practice over decades? You know, like I really want to hear your take on that. I think you're specifically qualified to to talk on that. So, yeah. <laughs> survival, I do. <laughs> um, I think you know. I think I'll speak for Tali. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fair, 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 fair. I, I think I think Tali might say that like if you're an artist, you just make art. That's just what you do, and no matter what, you're going to make art, and you just keep making it because that's that's the way that you interact with the world. Um, I think for us together, one thing that's been really amazing is for us to work together and be able to bounce ideas off of each other. That keeps things fresh and allows us to get a first round of kind of critical feedback on projects before they move even beyond that door. And a lot of times when we were working in this sort of institutional space, a lot of times it would involve an application. So we would have to come up with an idea, write that idea up, you know, produce per, perhaps some drafts or whatever images to go with it and, and submit that proposal then to another body that then would evaluate that and assess it. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, getting other feedback is also inspiring. I think one of the other things that uh, Tali would probably say is that, you know, ideas are, um, it's like, you could have a lot of ideas for what to make. And the, the thing that's most challenging is to bring this idea into the physical world and to sort of make that happen and then be able to let it go as a finished work. Well, the world, physical the world. or yes. not. The world, but physical or digital. Yes. That is like, the that's hardest that. thing. Everybody has an idea. Everybody's got a talent. The hardest thing is to put the work out there and contextualize it. Um, one other thing that I would say is that, you know, success of all kinds comes and goes. You know, there are highs and lows. I think the way that we operate, and again, that kind of maybe is very specific to us, is like we got into this business for like the love of experimental 
media, video, and sound, and specifically noise music. So, you know, at any moment that we have success, it's sort of like just like um an incre- incredible because we realize that uh we have kind of come into this from like communities and aesthetics and traditions that are like extremely frangy <laughs> and like we center every decision we make and what to do and who to work with on like honestly just like to be completely coherent with our vision and our mission and our own personal like choices so it's like you know we're not making pop music and so we never hold ourselves we don't compare I mean I don't maybe Kyle speak to Kyle <laughs> I who loves Taylor Swift uh, you know maybe he holds us maybe that's a different thing for me I look up to our he- our art heroes and so recently we went to this amazing concert a free concert at Hunter College um, a memorial for uh, an amazing composer Phil artist and filmmaker Phil Niblock, who died recently in eight, nine, age 90, I want to say. And Phil is like a legend in contemporary class, contemporary music, avant-garde uh, and film work. But he also, in addition to being just like, you know, and Josh Aaron for his own work, was like a community builder. He had his own not-for-profit and lived in his like the most New York space, like downtown loft for 40, 50 years where he hosted annual uh, music uh, series in his house to, that were attended by sometimes 10 people, sometimes 50 or 100, sometimes the top composers in the world, sometimes a bunch of students. And we were just at this concert that were like, how many synthesizers? There were like 50 or something musicians, many of them friends playing in like a circle and we were lying on the floor, or I only like to remember Kyle was there for the whole time in this like super loud, like a bunch of friends from New York from this like avant garde scene, like resonating noise synthesizer music and kind of and, and video by his um his partner Catherine. And I was like, you need to be reminded that this is what you came here for, that this is what it matters to us. And so Whatever a young artist, whatever got you into this, like ha- hold that, like put a photo of that thing in your studio, have a focal point that reminds you what you show up for every day. Cause that's, you gotta like, remember it when, when shit goes crazy, high and low, it gets crazy no matter where it is. Yeah. I think that's so, that's such great advice. And I think it's, um, what I guess one of the questions I have on that is like you know it's it's hard to um like you said before in the beginning when you were saying that of, of putting things out in the world right like how do you get the courage to put things out in the world like consistently right like um I think a lot of artists get uh they had they like their ideas they say this is really cool but maybe they put something out it doesn't get the response that they like and they kind of shrink back on that um uh how do you how do you have the confidence to continue to make and put out things that you think are cool without without like you know having maybe the reaction of the crowd or the or uh, you know kind of stop you from doing it right um i i would say that for us working together is really useful in that regard because um we have different ways of working, different styles and approaches. And I, I, I very much get into things being a certain way. And I, I know this isn't exactly the question you're asking, but I think it's very related. Um, I get into things being whatever the idea is. I want the artwork to end up matching that idea as perfectly as possible, even if the idea is very noisy and, and chaotic. Um, Tali really embraces that chaos all the way through from her whole approach. It's incredibly intuitive and just like whatever it is, that's what it is. And um, so I think that is useful in terms of having confidence in the work itself. Um, well, I mean, so there's certain things that we can like this, like chutzpah, you know, like that's kind of a word, but like, like, I don't know that like, 
you can sell someone, you have to be more confident. Like you are, you aren't. I think that the way that you can kind of get around it, if you're not just like used to like, just used to like um, getting beat up sometimes, you know, you just have to have that like, but you know, I can't, again, like not everybody, people are not made the same way. So like some people have more fragility and I want to like recognize that. But I think it's all about like setting your expectations to match the individual project and also the individual artists. And one of the things that I think is the most difficult in the crypto NFT space is that it's very kind of flat in a way that everything is presented and it's very hard to kind of find a way to have a more targeted community. So everyone is basically assessed in the same way. And so it just feels much bigger to make this like analogy again to like touring if you live in a small town and you have a show and your friends plus a few people and like 10 20 enthusiastic people show up you might feel really really great you're not holding yourself to the same uh standard as someone who has an, a show in a major metropolitan city and have like a big gallery or an eight or like a you know or like a record company behind them so because everything happens on the same place right now and crypto i think it's just it's just it's just harder to take and if there is a way i really hope that like i look i look towards young artists and people who are really crypto natives to develop these spaces where you are really can have like maybe maybe there's some discords i don't know of where you can really have a thriving smaller community and then an artist can just have targeted that because i think a lot of it is just like setting expectations and be really like kind of honest with yourself and have someone like kyle was saying we have each other but we have other collaborators and we have other kind of you know publishers that we work with um yeah so i think that there's something to be said for expectations so Tali talked about setting i think also limiting expectations and just sort of being open to what happens um i think there are some artworks that have been performed only once for only one person, for example. And that's, that can be a very incredible thing, right? It's, it's a question of like what kind of impact it makes, but some of those have gotten a ton of attention as well, right? Even though no one actually got to actually see the art other than this one person, right? What are you shouting at them? Wait, uh, no, you can't say? There, I mean, I don't want to shout that out. Oh, but okay. I'm just saying. Sorry, I don't know. Why. I'm just curious, but okay. I, I think that, you know, there are very cool things that can happen and that are not necessarily going to reach a million people or a billion people, right? And then there are also are works that are incredibly cool because they engage a huge population. And and I think that depends on what the work is and what there's partly the artist's intent of that work, but also just the happenstance of what happens in the in the world with the work once you release it. only the matrix of success right now in crypto nft world is just sales and so yeah. like that's that's like a kind of that's a kind of a big issue because like yeah like, that's what that's why yeah. i asked you the question right, right, i think right. that i, just forgot I think that, that you thing. have insight that i think a lot of artists that are are maybe have started in crypto native or they just they've just started the last couple of years um i think you have something you know what you're talking about is really valuable because you know I think a lot of the artists just have come up with this idea that, you know, they're just going to value their art based on how, what the floor price ends up being. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, they, 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 they then assign their worth to their floor price. Unfortunately. Well, unfortunately, um, it's not which, just them. It's not just them. And I want to recognize that. So it's not like, like, oh, you just think your worth is this. It's sort of like, you're sort of labeled a certain way based on your floor price and this kind of like, market driven reality but like that's like a really big difference between the way that our art works outside of crypto and it's not to say that like sales records have no value they do but when you make a piece an artwork whatever it is it's not like you show it once and it sells or it just like nothing happens to it it's like has a life it goes to different exhibitions people will see it People might want to write about it. There's like a whole other kind of set of metrics. You like, you know, it's not like 
it's not this like one time thing. And so, you know, we, we've been doing this with our uh, generative and NFT work. So it's like, no matter what happens to them, we continuously show them like we exhibit the work just like it's video or it's anything else. And so I think like the cultural value uh, is means something, <laughs> you know, it means something to us. It means something to the rest of the world. Um, so I, I do really encourage artists to think about their work past drop day and really think about like what, and sometimes the work, you know, you make something and you think it's one thing, but once it's in the world, it maybe is something different, you know, maybe it's not um, just an NFT piece. Maybe, maybe it's poster. Who knows what, I don't know. It's like a million ways of looking at it, into it. I've, and yeah, and it, it might be public art, you know, I, I don't know. So like, just really, that's, that's something I think that w is within um, artist control to do that. Yeah. It's also too that, you know, I think the market is a completely different beast almost, right? Like the, the mind of the market is, um, can't be controlled a lot of times by artists. It's, it seems random sometimes, you know, and, and I don't think, I, I think you would probably agree as well is that it doesn't necessarily align with, you know, really anything, you know, uh, sometimes. So it's, um, I think it's a learning to put your value as an artist on, the market. But I think if you do that, you're going to eventually be disappointed in one way or another. Right. And, um, I've seen it with artists, you know, just struggling to, you know, put work out there because they, their, their, um, definition of success of if they are successful or not is, is, is that floor price of what, what the market values it at. Right. Um, and not necessarily, does this make me happy? Does this, is this cool? Or, you know, to me, you know, is this something that I need to put out there? Right. Um, and I think that that is something that just is, is, uh, really important to get out there. And so artists know that like, um, uh, I think it, it can affect mental health and a lot of things like that, you know, that, uh, that's not the healthiest way to look at <laughs> creating art, right? If you're, yeah, if you're okay. creating art for the market, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, NFT works that are not for sale. I wonder if like people would try that and see how that feels, see what it that's feels like to make work not for sale, see what it does to the work and what, you know, what other ways of getting, um, support or appreciation you can get from that there are some what, cool projects like yeah that. like who life forms life um, forms yeah it's a great example lauren's work. lauren's work yeah lauren lee mccarthy yeah like some but those artists specifically who come from like the digital art world outside of nfts so um yeah i think like who, who, who knows long term anything but like i i would say definitely experiment taking the work for younger artists if you are kind of just like confused right now, like take the work out of the market for a bit and just make the art. I think also just getting inspiration from the community too. That's, that's really important. And that's, that's mm -hmm. a real privilege that we have in this space that like, no matter where you are, you have a community because it's worldwide. Yeah. It's, you know, it's slightly different than back in the day with, you know, where the scenes were kind of local and there was an international scene, but yeah. I think, I think uh, another question I had for you is, is you think like currently, you know, call it what you want, digital media, uh, art, you know, this type of experimental art. Do you think that this, uh, currently right now, as far as like the amount of art that's like created, right? It's, it's just still a small portion of the, of the entire pie. Um, do you think that that grows? Wait, what's think, the pie? What's the pie? I art? Mean, like just the whole art, art, Exactly. What well, art that's being created. I mean, you look at, you walk into a gallery in, in it's, it's a lot of paintings, you know, it's a lot of sculpture. It's a lot more traditional, um, stuff. That's, that's more uh, mediums that are, are established. Well, it's not that older. the digital art is created less. It's just that it's not seen a lot. I guess that's maybe, yeah. maybe what the, the maybe that's a good clarification. Of, yeah. It's not of digital art being created. Do you think, I guess, uh, to reframe my question, do you think that the appreciation for this type of art grows over time and in the future? Or do you think it's just always remains a kind of niche thing in the art world? That might be a disagreement between us. I would you say that ahead. it grows for sure. Because yeah. it's their sort of accessibility issues are big. That's, I think that's 
a big obstacle for anything Web3. There's all sorts of technological and educational barriers that people have, and that's really hard to overcome those, actually. And it's much easier, you know, anyone can pick up a stick and draw something in the dirt, for example, right? Or or draw that on some kind of wall somewhere or, or on a, even probably a canvas or a piece of paper. And it's, you know, the, the accessibility is a completely different thing when you need to have a computer and an internet connection, and, you know, all sorts of knowledge and a wallet and all this stuff. But that's not answering the question in terms of institutional recognition, which I think is what Ivan is asking. Yeah, I was, thinking, I was thinking more on that 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 realm, but it did answer the question in a way for sure. Yeah, yeah. Too. So it wasn't, it wasn't it wasn't completely in my field. Yeah, just uh, you know. I think that one of the things that's amazing about this space is the speed at which things move. It's super fast, and that's obviously very valuable for things to be fast and quick and early and whatever else. Um, large institutions in the rest of the art world are incredibly slow. The process takes years to do something that in Web3, like it would not be unusual to find out about something. A few, I think even with this... Um, meeting that we're having now, I think we were kind of talking about it with like very little notice. Things happen all the time where like you have like three days notice or a week or two and it's like, oh, yeah. can you do this project like now? And yeah. I think the rest of the art world doesn't move like that. And that's, you know, plus and minus, I think everything has- But not just and- not just the art world. I mean, the thing is that you have to look at how um, academic institutions are, are, are organized and how- museums are organized and you have to kind of see that they're their departments and uh we might think everyone is making digital art but actually everybody is painting and there's a reason for that and they're like departments in universities art schools and museums that are the painting departments are just bigger departments so the advantages of technology is that there's kind of excitement it's a new thing it kind of brings in youth in theory you know uh it brings in kind of you know tech entrepreneurs and all that but um that's not necessarily aligns with long-term missions of um the big institutions well i want to thank you both for coming today and uh, having this fantastic conversation with me um, I hope to do it again sometime. It's always great talking to you both and getting your um, just thoughts on everything. And I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.